Hello, everyone. Is your, is it working all right? Okay. Is that better? There we go. All right. <clears throat> all right. So thank you very much for having me here. This is uh, fantastic to talk to you all. Um, so uh, I'm Fred. Uh, I am currently leading the user experience design team at The Nerdery, which is a custom software design and development consultancy based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And right now we have close to about 40 diff designers spread across our four different offices in the United States. And uh, myself, I have been doing uh, UX for an embarrassingly long time now. And uh, in, during most of that time, I have been deeply involved in prototyping. And uh, I actually remember in 2000, I was doing a job interview, and uh, I expressed an interest in learning Flash, and that's how old this is, uh, to, uh, in order to be able to prototype and test my own designs. While that didn't work out, in 2005, I discovered something called Axure, which is a rich interactive prototyping tool that also does documentation. And what that did is that literally changed my career. Um, in 2000, or as a result of getting really into that and, and focusing on that a lot, uh, on the various UX mailing lists, if anyone remembers what those are, it's like Slack, but through email. Uh, we, I was actually known as the Axure guy. <laughs> much to the chagrin of the people who actually make Axure. Um, so it, by the time 2007 rolled around, uh, I was, I'd started doing workshops on Axure, and the company actually contacted me to say, hey, would you mind doing training for us? I said, sure. And I ended up creating the first official Axure training program. Uh, and I ran that until about 2012, and in that time, I probably trained over a thousand people how to use Axure. So I've been doing a lot of prototyping for a lot of years, which means I have done a whole lot of things wrong. And that's what we're here to talk about today is all my personal failings. Well, not all of them, that would take way too long. Um, but just the ones that are relevant to prototyping. Uh, so there have been tons and tons of things that I have learned over the years about how to prototype well and specifically how not to prototype well. For this talk, I've bubbled up 10 of the most important to the surface. And because I'm an information architect at heart, I, of course, have categorized them. Uh, we're looking at some tactical tips around prototyping, which are focused on how to build prototypes efficiently, how to get the most out of your prototyping endeavors, things like that. And we're also going to be looking at some strategic tips for pr prototyping, which help you uh, take your use prototyping to take your practice to the next level. It's about taking prototyping into the way you think rather than just another thing that you do. So let's get started with one of my favorites, which is to be lazy. I am actively encouraging you to be lazy. Uh, what this means is that I, I want you to learn that you don't need to prototype all the things. Um, one of the things that has, uh, or, or that is true in the UX world right now is that there's a plethora of prototyping tools. Uh, there was a time where it seemed like there was a new one coming out every couple of months. There's a lot of different things out there, and you can do a lot of crazy things with them. For example, JavaScript at this point is basically a front end to JavaScript. So if there's something that I want to do, I can probably do it in Axure. Just because I want to and can do it doesn't mean I should do it. So um, the focus here is to come up with goals. What are your goals for your prototype? Why are you building a prototype in the first place? Um, for example, you could be testing a, a, a new mobile app. That right there says a lot of things. First, it needs to be native mobile. Second, uh, it's actually going to be usability tested. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of guidance built up just in that context. Uh, it could be a very complex web application. So that's going to tell you a lot too because it's going to need to allow data entry and you're going to need to be able to go back and forth with the user in that system. Um, you, maybe you could even be doing a prototype, ta or a prototype that will never ever 
see a test that will never ever see users because it is enti entirely aimed at getting an idea out uh, of someone's head or getting alignment um, from stakeholders. Um, the, the thing that is really important to understand here is that um, when you're building a prototype, especially using a tool, you don't need to be perfect. Perfect will actually impede your progress and make things more difficult for you down the road because the bigger something is, the more it's going to take to manage. So I'll give you an example of um, something that I have done in the past that um, makes it so, uh, so that uh, it illustrates what I'm talking about. So you can see some of this stuff, like what's happening right now. This is fairly detailed. Uh, this is a system that is actually designed to be a remote health clinic, essentially. And in that little interaction that you saw, that was uh, an attendant putting information into the system, the vitals of that person. Um, now, this prototype was never, ever meant to be seen by users. And some, some of that, like the bit that happens just before this, you see stuff that says insurance UI, which is very much being lazy. Uh, but that's in there because we didn't need the details. That wasn't part of the goal. The goal was to help these eight stakeholders who all they had was a 500 line Excel spreadsheet full of requirements and, mind you, a different interpretation of each one of those lines in their minds. And this prototype helped unify their vision so that they could move forward with the project. So there's elements here that are really detailed and other elements that are fairly simplistic. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being lazy. Also, I'm not a visual designer, so no critiques, please. Uh, the second thing I want to talk to you about is planning. Um, if you plan before you prototype, this can uh, support laziness because you don't want to prototype more than you absolutely have to. And largely what I'm talking about when it comes to planning is usability testing. Now, uh, the very first thing I did in UX is usability testing. So this is something that, uh, that is just part of how I do design. So when I build a prototype, I usually intend to test it. Um, and what I have found is that if you r actually write the test plan before you build the prototype, that can increase your efficiency drastically because you don't end up prototyping what you don't need to. And it helps you also identify content that you might need in order to support these tasks. And we'll talk a little bit more about content in a bit. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about when I didn't do this. Uh, it was early on when I started doing prototyping. I had one really rough project that was rough because I didn't document things at the right time. So a lot of late nights there. And then the next project after that was this one where uh, I approached it, it was uh, for a medical device company. It was their main website and I wanted to prototype the whole thing. So I did, and that was a lot of effort, but I ended up missing a whole bunch of important stuff uh, that we really needed to test, that the company was really interested in. And we ended up, uh, I ended up having to do more late nights in order to get that stuff in before the test, because we wrote the test after we already had the prototype. Uh, and as a result of that, um, I had to take a very long drive to detox myself. Uh, I drove all the way around that very large lake, uh, well, almost all the way. To, uh, I got to about Marquette, uh, which is about three quarters of the way. And uh, that's what I needed to do uh, as a result of how much overwork I had put myself through, through not being very smart about how I prototyped. So uh, while Lake Superior is wonderful and I encourage you to do the drive, uh, I want to also encourage you to not put yourself into the situation where you have to do that. So let's talk about content for a little bit. Uh, content has become uh, a really big focus uh, in UX over maybe the last eight years or so, so much to, uh, to the point where we now have roles in UX that are specifically content focused, such as content strategy and UX writing. Um, and where this impacts prototyping is in the actual test. Because uh, when you are doing a prototype test, you're seeing how human beings are reacting 
to what you have set before them. Now, people react to content, not just to where you put the little form labels and things like that. Um, so in order for this to actually go smoothly, you need to have realistic content. Now, you don't need to have real content. It doesn't need to be final content. I understand that that process is, it's diff it can be difficult to get to final content, and that would impede the design process. But you can get to plausible content, realistic content, pretty well. You don't need to go through all the review cycles and things like that in order to get to that point. And what that will do is that will prevent uh, the error that happened in my very first prototyping test. Uh, what I did in my very first interactive prototype was to basically make wireframes that you could click on. And my wireframes were typically full of placeholder content, things that said title page and admittedly and ashamedly lorem ipsum. And so when I put something like that in front of people, what I found was that even when they were successful, they didn't realize that they were successful. So they kept going. And basically, the results of my very first prototype test were a wash. They weren't useful. So I very quickly learned, oh, yeah, I actually have to make this thing make sense. So I encourage you to do the groundwork up front to first understand the tasks that you're going to write in your usability test. Second, to understand the content that is required to support those tasks. Um, now, I tell you this, but there are two notable exceptions. Scientists and lawyers, both of whom I have worked extensively with uh, in my career. Uh, you cannot get away with plausible content with these folks. Uh, and with the scientists, they include doctors in that. Um, now, people in these professions have been trained to look at data closely and to analyze it and to really think in terms of data. What I have found is that when I've followed my own advice and put plausible content in prototypes for these audiences, they get really distracted and hung up when stuff is wrong. For example, uh, you, know, you could say, well, if that's 53, that can't be two. So I really don't understand what I'm supposed to do from here. And, and that graph just that isn't right. That doesn't reflect what I'm seeing here. And they can't move on through the task. So again, I'm basically making it so that my usability test doesn't give me any reasonable results that I can work off of. But if I actually put in real data, such as from an actual medical case, um, which, of course, I scrub of identifiable information, um, then the doctor can look at it, see what they expect to see, and then move on through the, uh, uh, through the task so that I can really see how they interact with the system. And that works a lot, a lot better. And uh, legal, uh, folks in the legal profession are eg almost exactly the same. So if I'm doing something where uh, a, a search result is going to result in uh, certain cases, I am actually going to do that search on a legal database and see what comes up and put as close as I can into the actual prototype. And that will help me get good information from those folks. Uh, the next thing I want to encourage you to do is to th really think low fidelity. Now, uh, fidelity is something that we talk a lot about when it comes to prototyping. Myself, I see fidelity as being multidimensional. So, uh, what that means is there's a lot of different uh, things that can have high and low fidelity. For example, uh, visual fidelity is what we typically think of is would be how close does it look to the real aesthetic of the, the final product. Um, a, a situation in which you might need a high level of visual fidelity would be if you are testing something uh, that has uh, um, for a, a brand type website. So you want to see what the emotional reaction is. Um, if you are pitching an investor, for example, you really want to make sure that it looks good because if it looks junky, then you're probably not going to get any money. Um, the other key dimension to think of too is functionality. So w what is the level of functional fidelity that you need? Uh, again, if you are pitching an investor, maybe you don't need a super high level of functional fidelity, but you need to show something that sort of moves around and works. 
If you just have an idea, you can have a very low level and you can just sketch some stuff out on a few pieces of paper and run a paper prototype test. And early on in the design process, that's usually a lot better because you can move quickly and you answer the questions that you need answered early on in the process. But if you're doing something where, for example, you know that you're gonna need to do a, a usability test, it's a complex application with a lot of flow and a lot of different kind of data, that's something you're gonna need a high level of, uh, of functional fidelity for because it, 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 you know, if you're just doing something like on paper or in Envision where you can't really enter data, you're just sort of clicking through things or moving through things, that's going to not answer the types of questions you're going to have. Um, <clears throat> and with, with this, you know, this goes back to goals. Um, this is something where uh, you have the ability to go really deep with most prototyping tools, but you don't always have the need. So again, be lazy, have your goal. Uh, what is the lowest level of visual, functional, uh, or visual and functional fidelity that you can get away with in order to achieve your goal? Um, so I, I do want to share a, a story about this, and this is a story about the humble Kleenex box and how it saved my ass one day. Um, so I was working with a particular uh, or a potential client, and uh, what we were got into the we got into the situation where in an hour had to come up with this idea of or for an Internet of Things enabled medication dispensing system. Uh, an hour. <laughs> so that was easy. No, it was not easy. Uh, we worked in a panicked fashion with some of the stakeholders to identify some of the business cases and the business issues uh, and came up with some information about users. Obviously, none of this was based on true research. Uh, and so we started to, to formulate this idea of a dispenser that, you know, every time you opened the, the lid, it would do a thing. It would send a, not a tweet, but a, you know, some information uh, through the net. And I was all set to build this thing with, you know, tape and manila folders. Uh, and that was just, that was not going to go anywhere good, I guarantee. But then I saw a Kleenex box. And I'm like, oh, my savior. I can get into this Kleenex box. I made a couple of incisions, uh, gutted it, and put in uh, a couple of other little pieces of paper. And voila, I had my opening medication dispenser. Um, and so... If you're thinking in this mindset of how scrappy can I be? How, you know, what kind of crazy things can I do to achieve my goal? You start looking at Kleenex boxes and seeing medication dispensers. It's a pretty cool shift that happens in your brain. So uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about is choosing the appropriate tool for the job. Because, like I said earlier, there's tons and tons of prototyping tools out there. And uh, I imagine a number of you are developers and have the, school, the skills to do this yourself. So that's something that you have to factor in there, too. Maybe it's just easier to just write code. That's entirely possible. And at the nerdery, there are a number of situations in which we actually do that. Um, but a few things about what makes it the right tool for the job. Um, first off is, again, your goal. What, what level of fidelity, for example, do you need, or functional fidelity, do you need to achieve your goal? Okay, well, if you need a lot of functional fidelity, something like Envision or maybe Balsamic isn't going to work so well because those are basically click-through tools. So you're going to be looking at something like Principle or Axure. Is it uh, something, are you doing something that's native mobile? If it's native mobile, maybe you're looking at Principle um, because that actually outputs... Uh, a native mobile app and uses a lot of the uh, the stock animation uh, uh, type things. So there's a lot that goes into this. Um, and, and one of the things that I highly recommend, uh, there is a, uh, a, an agency called Cooper out of San Francisco, and they have a, a blog post that they actually update somewhat frequently where they compare all of these different prototyping tools. Now, most of the time, I think those types of, uh, of blog posts really aren't helpful. But with this, they actually compare based on some really helpful information. So uh, Google Cooper 
prototyping tools, and you'll come to what you need to uh, help you get a sense of uh, what's the most important thing. Um, well, another component of this, too, is also what you're good at. So for me, the answer is almost always Axure. It's actually a kind of a joke on our design team. Uh, someone actually on our Slack channel created uh, a very annoying uh, custom action that posted a, a hypnotic gif of my face every single time anyone wrote the word Axure. It's very annoying, but also very funny. <laughs> Uh, but that might not be you, and Axure is now fairly complicated, so it takes a while to get good at it. So what are you good at? What are your collaborators good at? Uh, at the Nerdery, uh, we spend a lot of time working with developers, um, the design and development team together. So a lot of the time, the answer is no prototyping tool at all. The answer is just communicating effectively and with developers and collaborating with them. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a, a, a time where I did this. These four extremely poor sketches are basically the sum total of documentation that I gave to a developer for a project that we worked on together. Now what this isn't showing is all of the communication and collaboration that we did. She was a UX developer, which was an interesting role that we experimented with, which was someone who is, uh, has solid front-end skills and is mostly a front-end developer, but also has uh, some affinity for design and some talent for design. So she was involved with me in all of the stakeholder research and all of the user research. So she had seen and heard everything I had seen and heard, and we worked together sketching things out. But instead of making a wireframe or even a prototype, what she did is she just created these in HTML and, a, and created styles but didn't really define those styles. Uh, and what this ended up doing is it ended up uh, saving the front-end developers about 40 hours of work when we, uh, when we actually came to develop it. And it gave us a, 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 a reasonable prototype that we could use pretty much straight away without me futzing around in Axure at all and ha having to not go down the, the rabbit hole of conditional logic and all sorts of fun things like that. Um, another example uh, is something that we've been using a lot lately, which is called... Uh, inspect, which is a feature that Envision has. And it's pretty cool because what it does is it takes a sketch file, which a lot of uh, our designers use, and uh, sort of highlights the important things for developers, such as spacing between elements. Uh, if you look there on the right, you can even see specific CSS code that you can get out of it. Um, a couple of developers a week asked me for access to Envision just for this feature. Uh, there's also another thing that I think has been around a little bit longer called Zeppelin with one P um, that I know people use. It does something similar, but it's not quite as uh, integrated in, into the workflow. So those are things that you should uh, definitely check out if this is what you do. So the, the last uh, tactical example that I want to talk to you, or a tactical tip that I want to talk to you about is show and tell. So prototyping is great because you get to show what you're talking about. It's way better than wireframes. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I did a traditional wireframe uh, because those are flat documents. They have a bunch of annotation that tells you how this thing is supposed to work. But showing is almost always better than telling, except you can't just show. Just showing doesn't really reveal all the detail because design starts here, the really big picture, and then has to go down to all these little details. As any developer in the room knows, there's a lot of different things you have to think about that sometimes designers don't actually think about. Um, so one of the things I like to, to recommend to people is that when you're looking at your prototype overall, make sure you show at least one example of every single type of interaction in your prototype. But there are going to be interactions where there are multiple versions of exactly the same thing. Um, for example, error messages. I personally love this error message. It is one of the most confusing I have ever seen. Error! Everything went right. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> clearly that is an error. Um, but you know, just think of a login page. Off of the top of your head, you can probably come up with five or six different things 
that can go wrong on a login page. Now, should you prototype all five or six of those things? You could, but you don't need to. And that just leads to a big bloated prototype that first you have to make and then you have to maintain. So my recommendation is just you know, write the error message and show what happens when someone gets their username wrong. Just that one and that you go through the formatting, if anything moves around, if anything is highlighted, you show that. But then in documentation, like I said, I use Axure a lot, which integrates documentation, so that's how I do it. Um, you write all of the, the different variations. So then you would say, if the password is wrong, this is the message. If both are wrong, then this is the message. If uh, the account has been deleted, then this is the message, so on and so on and so on. Um, and that is a good balance between showing and telling. So that's what I have for you for the tactical recommendations. Now we're going to move into the more strategic recommendations. The first one that I want to talk about is probably the most impactful. When I said that when I dis discovered Axure, everything changed for me, it was because of this. Um, up until that point, I had been a fairly conservative designer um, where I would go after established practices. I would look to see how other things had been done on the web. Really, I wasn't very good <laughs> because I wasn't being very creative because I wanted to go with what I knew worked. With a, a prototyping tool, I now had the ability to have crazy ideas and test them out. And that worked wonders for me. Um, I cannot think of any other time where a tool actually made me a better designer, but this did. The tool got me to prototyping, and prototyping helped me think about uh, design in a completely different sort of a way. So uh, with a prototyping tool or with a prototype, the advantage here is that you can have these crazy ideas, and it's okay if you fail. In fact, you probably will fail, but you'll usually fail in a way that is productive in some way. So you, the end product of this might be something that's still fairly traditional, but with maybe an extra little bit of delight that isn't in many other interactions of that same type because you pushed the envelope. You tried to innovate, and instead of failing in the marketplace, which is bad because that has financial consequences, you failed in design, which is good because that teaches you something and ultimately makes your design better. I will uh, give you an example of uh, how this impacted one of my designs. So this over here, these are our 23 hu human chromosomes. So this is all of us, every single one of us. Yay. <laughs> Yay, genomics. Um, and what we see here is, you know, all these chromosomes are different sizes, but they also have these bands on them. Those bands are called cytobands. Uh, I don't exactly know what they are, <laughs> but they actually show up in certain types of uh, microscopic imaging. Now, I was working with a client who was building a data visualization system to help people identify uh, interesting genetic characteristics for specific individuals that have uh, cancer. Uh, and these, what they were looking for is interesting aberrations in their genome that might say, or that might lead to the possibility of a cure for that cancer through some completely unique and customized treatment. The example I always give is taking amp, uh, aspirin could cure your cancer. It's not usually that simple, but it's, it's stuff like that that's a little bit weird. Um, so the, the lo now, in each chromosome, there are thousands of genes. So in a digital representation, trying to accurately indicate where uh, a, a gene was doing something weird was pretty challenging. So it was my theory that cytobands would help people or help the scientists who were working with this actually understand where they were. But I was told by the people I was working with, no, 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 only molecular geneticists uh, care about cytobands. Side note, wouldn't that be cool to be a molecular geneticist? I don't even really know what they do, but that sounds super awesome. Um, and uh, but I, w I was thinking, well, it's going to be really hard for people to orient where they're at. So I had a crazy idea that I was able to implement in a prototype. What I did is I just created a uh, 
sort of a layer that users could control so that they could dim the cytobands or, or make them uh, very visible like they are here. Uh, and I wanted to see if that was going to be something that was going to help people uh, interpret their results. And when we went through prototype testing with this, no one used it. We didn't test with any molecular geneticists, but that's cool. What that did is that made it so that I had this idea, I tested it, turns out it didn't really go anywhere, and that's okay. I didn't get into any fights with the client over it because this was, this was the design process. This was having ideas and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Now, the next one that I want to talk to you about is something that I don't actually have a story for because the story is all prototyping stories. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot uh, from designers, uh, it's this language that I hear on project teams. Oh, we're going to do some validation testing or we are, you know, we're going to validate the design with users. Um, to that, I say, no, thank you, <laughs> because that is not the right mindset to get into. The mindset you need to adopt is to be more interested in your failures than in your successes. What this does for you is this helps you do something, well, it helps me do something that in the UX world is kind of a big no-no. I test my own prototypes. Uh, most UX designers say, no, 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 you need to get someone else to do that because bias. Yes, I agree, because bias. But what this mindset does for me is that I almost don't care what I get right. I don't care what works about the design. I care, what does, I care about what doesn't work. So what that does is that helps me greatly reduce the bias in my testing, and it allows me to do a lot of testing throughout the process and do it quickly because I don't need to get anyone up to speed or anything like that. Uh, and for the, the designers in the room, yes, I do actually lie to participants and tell them that I had nothing to do with the design, but you got to do what you got to do. Because, um, you know, people often feel bad about, you know, if they're going to provide negative feedback to someone who worked hard on a thing, they don't want to do that, so you tell them that you didn't work on it, and it works out better. Um, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is uh, what you can prototype. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about things with screens, digital products, um, web applications, native mobile apps, things like that. Yes, obviously, we can prototype those. That's very useful to do. But there are so many uh, different things that you can prototype, uh, including clickers, which they could have prototyped this one a little bit better. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> um, for example, there are some things that I have done, uh, such as job roles. Um, there were some new job roles that we created at the nerdery that we had never really seen on any other design team. So before we actually gave someone those jobs, we actually created a prototype of what that job would look like, had people do it. We learned some things, tweaked some stuff, and then ended up making a real job out of that. Um, you can also prototype entire businesses. Um, there is a, an example of where I did that, which I'll share a little bit later. Um, now, if you have an idea, wouldn't it be better to go out and look at uh, and put that idea in front of the people who it might impact before you choose to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in building a business? That's the theory, and you can actually do it. Uh, and one of my favorite stories about this is a story I only recently heard about. Anyone in, in here listen to 99% Invisible, the podcast? couple of folks? Okay. If you don't listen to it, you should really listen to it. It's fantastic. Very, very interesting. Lots of design stuff. Lots of random knowledge. Um, but in this latest episode, they talked about something called the Finnish experiment. And uh, bless the Finns, they have a specific office in their government called the Office of Experimentation. And the entire purpose of this office is to uh, look at creating new laws through human-centered design. Oh, Finland is like this paradise for me. Lots of snow and human-centered government. Yay. Uh, and also crazy rally car drivers. Also good stuff and good music. Um, so yay, Finland. But, uh, for example, this, this diagram, this actually was downloaded from a Finnish government website. And what this is talking about is it's identifying over there in that lower left corner grassroots needs. 
So they're, they're looking at different needs out there in the world, or in Finland specifically, and figuring out, okay, well, how can we test this out? Uh, we need to have some sort of hypothesis, and then we break it down into some sort of testable element. Uh, another diagram also from the, the same website makes that a little bit more obvious. It starts off talking about uh, formulation. So you're coming up with this idea and ways to test it, and you implement it in some uh, minor way, evaluate it uh, based on its uh, effectiveness and the cost of change, and then uh, it gets more support, and it keeps going around in that circle. If you can prototype laws, you can prototype anything. This is one of the, the uh, I think, most critical mindset shifts that happened sort of later in my career for me. Uh, this helps me uh, approach almost any design problem, no matter how constrained, with a great deal of flexibility. So really, you can prototype anything. Um, another thing that we think of prototyping is, is that it has a specific uh, location within the design process, kind of in the middle. You know, you've worked on the design, and now you want to test it. That's great. That works really well. But it doesn't have to just be there. It can be in lots and lots and lots of different places. Uh, a common theme that we hear at the nerdery is we have people coming in who have this idea for a product that's been in their heads for years. And you know, they want to build this, and they, you know, they want to get going, and they want to get it out on the App Store right away. Um, and what they don't want to hear is, well, we have to do three months of research and validation testing. Uh, in order to make sure that this is going to work. They don't want to hear that. That's not where they're at. So what we do is we say, okay, sure, we'll work with you. And then we work with them to sort of pull the idea out of their head, and we build a prototype. And what that prototype does is that gives them something to react to, and that gives us something to put in front of users. And when we put that idea in front of users, what we do is we uh, end up eliciting more requirements. We find out uh, things that we both missed and things that we put in that really aren't necessary. And we also learned a little bit about users at the same time. So we've actually done a little bit of user research without calling it user research. It's fantastic. Um, and this is uh, an example, too, of where you can potentially uh, prototype a business. So this is an example of, I, I know this probably doesn't look like a prototype to you. This looks like a document, and you're right, it is. We'll get to that in a moment. But this business came, to, or this group of, of uh, founders came to us thinking uh, about this business that they wanted to create. And so I ran them through uh, a couple of workshops focused on identifying um, you know, who the people would be that are part of this process that they want to create. Uh, what the sort of business case was, and then another one where we actually came up with the entire customer journey uh, or, or the user journey that they would have. And we thought a lot about this, and this was not based on a lot of research. Um, so this was all, mostly hypothesis. Um, and the whole purpose of this was uh, to actually take it out to people. So what we did is we made a different version of that journey for the client to actually put in front of people and get their reaction. And what this did is this helped them validate whether their business was something that was going to be uh, uh, effective or something that, it, that was not going to go anywhere because people weren't interested in doing it. Now, this was an interesting case because one of the founders actually was a professor, a uh, university level professor of uh, social science research. So she actually had way more <laughs> research background than I do. So she uh, was able to sort of lead those sessions herself. Normally we would have helped clients with, with that part too. But this is an example of how you prototype a business. You, you have an idea, you represent that idea, and then you put it out there into the world to get some feedback on it. So that's what I have for you today. We've talked about uh, several tips for prototyping, a few of them tactical, a few of them strategic, and all of them, I think, can have a pretty big impact on your practice. I hope you can take some of these back uh, and build them into your existing prototype, prototyping practice if, if you have one. If you don't, 
Uh, follow these tips and you will avoid doing a lot of wrong things. I have done all the wrong things for you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and if you want to talk more about this, I believe we do have about five minutes for questions and I'll be around uh, the rest of the time too. I'd be happy to uh, talk prototyping with you at any point. So thank you. <laughs>